Good afternoon. No, one more time. Good afternoon. Well, we'll, we'll settle for that. Uh, when Donna Marie called me and asked me if I would be willing to talk about uh, intimacy and recovery, for a moment I thought of saying no because I have never talked about intimacy and recovery before. I'm about 36 years old. I've never been married. I come from a horrible family situation, which is the reason I've never been married. I figured, why replicate mistakes? And um, I nearly said no, because I said, what could I possibly bring to a talk on intimacy and recovery, except maybe a what not to do type of scenario for you? But in thinking about it, I thought there was probably a great deal that I could bring, because, you know, not being married not having children, I could speak as a true expert, as I do with the patients that I work with. Okay? I don't think anyone that has kids can possibly be objective about parenting, nor do I think that anyone who is actively married can possibly be objective about marriage, which I'm finding out rapidly as my own marriage is getting close. So let's begin at the beginning. There are, there's really a whole segment of human realities that cannot be described in words. There's a whole segment of reality that words simply cannot describe. And intimacy falls into that realm. It's indescribable in words. It must be experienced. And any attempt to talk about it is really going to diminish and distort the experience. If I were to ask you for a moment, and I think I will, ask you to do this. Just turn to the person next to you for just a moment and reach out and touch them. And while you're touching them, just one person, look that person right in the eyes and say hello. Now, put that experience into words, if you will. That's the beginning. You know, that's the start of what may develop into intimacy. Now, what I would like to do in the course of the next 40 minutes is attempt to talk about something that really can't be adequately described, namely intimacy. I'm going to start out by defining in a, what I call an addictive approach to intimacy. There's a whole different way that addicted people, alcoholics, chemically dependent people, compulsive overeaters, etc., approach addiction because they uh, approach intimacy because they bring with them their addiction-centered value systems. So what I'm going to do is describe to you the components about the 16 major components that I see of an addiction-centered approach to intimacy. And then I'm going to explain to you the consequences of that. Following that, I'm going to define what intimacy is from a non-addict's perspective. When we take a look at what is possible from intimacy, what is it? What is the experience of intimacy? And finally, I'm going to look at the obstacles to intimacy. Both, both in a family context for the non-addict, because being intimate in a family situation is far from easy, even if you don't have an addictive disease present. And then we're going to talk about some of the special obstacles to intimacy that occur with a recovering addict, a recovering alcoholic, chemically dependent person, particularly in the first one to three years of their recovery. Now, let's begin at the beginning. What is an addictive approach to intimacy? What are the basic assumptions that a recovering addict typically brings into relationships with people? Okay? Now, you'll recognize many of these things as familiar of the psychodynamic attitudes that addicts have about life in general that are instantly applied to addiction. 
The first one here is the issue of a short-term gain. Okay, what do addicts want? I want it right now. I want to feel good. I want to feel better. I want to make it work. So what type of person do you suppose a recovering addict is drawn towards? Calm, stable, responsible, mature people who calmly go about living their life and achieving comfort and joy and satisfaction. That ain't in the cards. I want someone that's going to blow my mind right now. Namely, the best candidate are hysterical personalities who live extremely high-risk lifestyles who are extremely, you know, I mean, in terms of men looking towards women, they really prefer women who are incest victims who have learned how to relate primarily through seduction. Um, they prefer people who are going to exude sexuality, mystery, intrigue, and someone who's going to get into highly exciting, highly intense sexual relationships with. Isn't that what we want? Gee, that's neat. Now, secondly, what do addicts expect whenever they feel good? What does an addict expect? Well, they want more. That's what they want. But what do they expect? Addiction, short-term gain followed by long-term pain, okay? So the next element of an addictive approach to intimacy is the relationship has to periodically blow up on you. It just has to. It's got to blow your mind, and then it's got to lead to severe emotional distress, and it's got to be, by definition, a problematic relationship that swings between highs and lows, okay? Okay? Because I can't possibly feel good without later punishing myself for the experience. Pain-free pleasure does not enter into an addict's mentality. For maybe two to five years into sobriety, they can't even comprehend that it's possible for us to feel good without hurting later. So short-term gain, I'm going to blow my mind on this relationship, long-term pain. I know relationships are hard. I know relationships are going to be a struggle. I know there's a price you have to pay. And they just set themselves up for that price. Of course, never thinking that maybe their selection criteria have been a bit faulty. Now, the third thing is a predictable outcome. Okay? I know that this is how relationships work. I'm going to feel really good, but it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. I know this. It's going to be predictable. I meet this person. I feel compelled and attracted to get together with them, called neurotic attraction, by the way, because they're going to match my addict addiction-centered personality. And I know this is going to hurt me in the long run. I know it beyond a doubt. So criteria three, it's predictable. I know it's going to happen, which leads us to criteria four. I feel compelled to do it to myself anyway. The need for that short-term high, the need for that short-term drive is so strong and so compelling that even though I know beyond a doubt that this is going to blow up on me, I'm going to do it. I've got to do it. Okay? Now, as a result, I'm now getting into this thing. Remember, the, remember what addicts go through with alcohol and chemicals? As soon as the loss of control becomes evident, what's the next component? What do they try to do? I'm going to over-control. I am not going to get into this relationship and get into a natural free-flowing movement with the relationship because that's going to kill me. I'm going to have to get into over-controlling behaviors. I'm going to have to control my partner. I'm going to have to control myself. I'm going to have to control my kids. Because I know that if I don't control, I'm going to get hurt. Well, I know I'm going to get hurt anyway, but maybe by controlling it, I can get hurt less. So addictive-prone relationships after the immediate period of infatuation ends are generally marked by extremely rigid over-control. Now, there's a loss of control, isn't there, in addictive-centered relationships. There is a loss of control. I try to control, but I can't. And the seesaw effect of intense, intense pleasure followed by intense pain or discomfort continues. I get addicted to the highs, and I pay the price of the lows. And so here I sit 
in this relationship. But now let's look at some of the other features. As an addiction-prone person, I'm self-centered. What am I really looking for in a relationship if I'm, an, if I'm a recovering addict that hasn't fully recovered yet, that has not gotten myself to the point where I've overcome my addiction and the values and the addiction-centered values that shape that addiction? I'm extremely self-centered. And I approach this relationship with the attitude of, I'll only love you if you enhance my concept of me. I will only love you if you feed back to me in a positive way Positive reinforcement of my pathological self-concept. Okay? You tell me what I want to hear. You support what I want you to support. Of course, open and honestly. Okay? Okay, when you and he, it's called narcissism, if you're into a big term. You know, you are only of value to me to the extent that you reinforce my self-concept. I was doing counseling with one gentleman. He was single and he couldn't understand why. You know, he couldn't get, a, couldn't get a meaningful relationship going. He was telling me the experience of the first date he went on. And I, he sat there for the first two and a half hours of the dinner he took this young lady out to, and he talked about himself continuously for two and a half hours, just absolutely continuously. As a result of the intensive, excellent counseling I was providing, after two and a half hours, it dawned on him that he was doing something wrong. See, therapy is effective. So... Based upon, again, the expert guidance and communication I had given him, he turns to the young lady and says, you know, I've really got to apologize to you. I got carried away. For the last two and a half hours, we've been talking, I've been talking about myself, and it's been selfish of me. Let's change the subject and talk about something else. What do you think of me? Okay. Now, this is, this is the approach, the self-centeredness. Now, the next thing that a person gets is a pathological need for intense satisfaction all the time. What do I want in a relationship? I don't want much. I want to be intensely satisfied with you as my partner all the time. As a matter of fact, I can only really love you and care about you to the extent that you provide that intense satisfaction to me. And not only should you provide it, you've got to like doing it. Because if you don't like doing it, you really don't love me and you really don't care about me. That's a spin-off of this self-centeredness. I'm not in this for you. I'm in it so that you can enhance me. I'm in it so that you can make me feel good. And if we have sex and pigeon doesn't, pigeons don't fly out of my ears immediately afterwards, there's something wrong with you. Hence, there's something wrong with us. And hence, I really can't love you anymore. I really can't do that because you're not giving me the intense satisfaction that I deserve. Now, this leads to a state of mind called obsession. I'm constantly thinking about this relationship, and I'm constantly over-controlling it. How can I make it better? How can I make it perfect? How can I get what I want out of this crazy thing? How can I make this relationship work? So um, I think about the relationship and put a psychotic focus on the relationship, and everything else in my life becomes secondary to this relationship. I don't recognize that a relationship is a vehicle for productive living. A relationship is a vehicle to live sanely and soberly in the world. It is a vehicle to self-esteem. It is a vehicle to accomplishment. It is a vehicle to feeling good about myself and contributing to the world. That's not the addict's perception. The relationship is a vehicle to making me feel better now, and I've got to think about it, and if I don't put that as number one in my life, and other things start to suffer when this addiction-centered value system gets into a relationship. It starts to suffer because the relationship is super important. And now the compulsion starts. i got to make it better and better and better and better and better and better and better We've got to have sex more often. The sex has got to be better. We've got to communicate more intensely. Let's have some more painful growth experiences if that's going to make it better. Let's go to couples marathons and marriage renewal. And if a person engages in all kinds of artificial contrivances to make the relationship more intense. And the, these things don't become bridges between the two individuals. They don't facilitate the people living more meaningful lives. They, in fact, become walls between the two individuals as they play an artificial game of loving one another. 
Now, this then leads to magical expectations. I know if I get this relationship right, I'm going to be okay. I know that. If I get this relationship right, if I can bond to this person in the right way, have the right sexual experience, have the right level of communication, I know beyond a doubt I'll be okay. My job will straighten out. My life will straighten out. I'll lose weight. I'll get off of caffeine. I'll start exercising. All of this good stuff will magically happen if this relationship works out. God, that's not reality, however. If you've got a good relationship, it means one thing. You've got a good relationship. I know unemployed people that have beautiful relationships. I know fat people who are caffeine addicts who have beautiful, healthy relationships, okay? That doesn't make the person perfect. Now, because of this belief, you know, I've got to really get myself ready to play the role. So the addict brings into a relationship a large degree of grandiosity. A large degree of grandiosity. I only have a right to expect this from you because I'm so great myself. And this grandiosity leads to a problem in the relationship. I am really good. I am really worthwhile. I'm really a loving, caring, tender person. I'm really better than anybody else I know, as a matter of fact. And as a result of that, I think you're pretty lucky to have me. As a matter of fact, as I think about it, why the hell am I hanging around you? You know, it's kind of like the, the, the addictive prone guy in the singles bar walks up, walks up to a gal and says, hey, you know, why don't we, I really like you, I think you're a good person, why don't we communicate and really get to know each other then an hour or two go up to my place? And she looks at him and says, look, I wouldn't be caught dead with an idiot like you. And she stands up and she walks away. His buddy comes up and says, says, says what happened? And the guy, guy says, you know, I really feel sorry for that poor lady. She didn't want to spend time with me. You know, that's the grandiosity factor. When a person is into grandiosity, they actually feel bad that people can't handle a relationship with them. You know, if you were really together, you could handle me. If you were really together, you could accept this level of intimacy, this intensity that we have. I'm sorry you're so screwed up, you can't handle a truly intense person. Okay? Now... The grandiosity covers up the addict's Achilles heel, which is low self-esteem. What's the two characteristics of addicts? High levels of self-confidence, I believe I can move the world, underpinned by very low levels of self-esteem. I don't really think I'm worth shit. But what happens underneath? You know, I could never lower myself to be involved with someone who could love a schmuck like me. How can I possibly love someone who has such low standards in relationship that they get involved with a creep like me? How could I ever do that? So you've got, you see the inner turmoil that develops in the addiction, in the addicted relationship? Okay, that low self-esteem and grandiosity causes mixed messages all over the place. And now this leads again to more over-control through the other, another characteristic, which is called perfectionism. I must be perfect and have the perfect relationship. It's got to be right. All the I's got to be dotted. All the T's got to be crossed. And if it can't be perfect, screw it. The modified serenity prayer, for those of you who don't know. So as a result, I'm in a cycle. I'm making this relationship perfect so it'll make me okay. And then it doesn't work out, screw it, and I totally back out of the relationship and seek another addictive outlet, generally a casual, unproductive, destructive sexual relationship somewhere else, or compulsive overwork, or a return to addiction, active drug use to get away from that for a little while. And then I get disgusted and self-loathing, and, oh, i got to come back and get that goodie again, because remember the intensity that's there. I've got to have this back. Okay? Now there's guilt. I'm out of control of this relationship. It's up and down. I know I'm at fault, and I feel guilty. So I've got to punish myself for my human failing. Punish myself for the fact that I don't have the perfect relationship. Forgetting the fact there is no such thing. There is no such animal as a perfect relationship. And I also have to punish myself for another thing. 
as a recovering addict, as a recovering alcoholic or drug dependent person, I ain't normal. I've got neurological damage that follows me into recovery. I have psychodynamics that are just all screwed up because of my years of destructive chemical use. I've got the work of recovery program. There's all kinds of problems, which we're going to talk about later, which make me different. And I've got to punish myself for that, too. Because, you see, many addicts who get into these kinds of relationships really haven't come to terms with the fact that they're sick. They still, in their own hearts, say, I impose this upon myself by being a bad person. And if I weren't bad enough to drink that much and use that much drugs, I wouldn't be like this. They haven't accepted yet that they've got an illness. Okay? This is followed by shame. I can't make this work. I must be a defective human being. I must be extremely defective. There must be something wrong with me. I don't fit in. And to deal with my defectiveness, it leads to the last characteristic, which is denial. I cannot acknowledge to myself, to the people I love, or to the people in the world how defective I feel. So now I'm in a state of denial. I have an inability to recognize the reality of what's going on in my relationship. So, of course, what do I have to do? I've got to use all of the above characteristics, but harder in order to make it work. And I get back locked into that chain of addictive intimacy. What's the end result? The end result is a four-phase cycle in the addictive relationship. A four-phase cycle. The first is intense pleasure. Wow! Isn't this great? He, she is the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It's called infatuation. If you want the definition of infatuation, I will give it to you. Infatuation is a state of temporary insanity marked by an intense sense of euphoria and the inability to see another human being realistically. That's infatuation. You fixate on some positive characteristics without fixating on anything else, without noticing anything else. The infatuation breaks. What happens? Any, any of you familiar with this cycle, by the way? Second phase of the cycle is intense pain. It hurts. The infatuation goes away, and I feel crazy, inadequate, defective, and I don't know what to do to make it better. The pain goes away, followed by disillusionment. Relationships are never going to work out anyway. Why don't I just go back to the meat markets in the single sections of town and just screw my brains out? What the hell is the sense? Why don't I get divorced? Why don't I have an affair? This intimacy, it's not worth the price you got to pay. The disillusionment lasts until we can't stand it anymore. Then comes desperate action. I'll do anything to make it better, at which point I apologize, make amends, intense pleasure occurs again, and I'm off and running. And there goes the cycle. Intense pleasure followed by intense pain, followed by disillusionment, followed by desperate action to make myself okay through this relationship again, and it starts all over again in cycle until it spirals out of control. And you either get used to that as a lifestyle, or both people by mutual assent give up, and they live apathetically in each other's presence. They simply make a mutual coexistence pact where they just kind of live together and they numb themselves off and they don't experience anything, or eventually the relationship ends and the person goes out and recreates the same thing with somebody else. Okay. Now, does this sound accurate? Okay. Now, the problem is popular media, movies, televisions, novels, and so on, promote these types of relationships as normal and healthy. As a matter of fact, Leo Biscalia is the number one advocate for addictive relationships in this country. If you really look at what he's saying, you want relationships that are intensely satisfying, that you benefit from now, and if they don't work out, it's been nice, but I'm going to go find somebody else. Long-term commitment doesn't enter into this me-now, me-centered, immediate gratification concept of human relationships. And the problem is that there's an extreme limitation in what can be experienced in a short-term, high-intensity relationship. There are extreme limitations to that. 
And after a while, a person gets numbed off to that experience, and they crave for more, but if they don't know how to find it, they can't. Now, let's just, let's compare this addictive definition of intimacy, which we just went through, with a more realistic definition of intimacy and see what it is. If you've got your um, little booklets, they're, Everything I'm going to say from this point on is in the outline, so if you want to capture it or follow along, you can. What is intimacy in the real world? If you break out of an addictive-centered value system, what is intimacy? Well, intimacy is a close personal relationship that's marked by affection, love, and a depth of knowledge or a broadness of information about another person. This depth of knowledge and information causes a complete intermixing or interweaving of interests and activities. Now, let's take this and look at, at this one time. First of all, intimacy is a close personal relationship. People have to have proximity to each other to be intimate. Now, this may seem like something that's so basic. It, it's just so basic we have to think about it. But how can I be intimate with you? If I don't have contact with you in close association with you, close personal contact, that's the number one criteria. We see two, two hours a day as we're running around cleaning up the house and doing our laundry, getting ready to collapse in exhaustion at night. We have to have some prime time where that person is a central focus for our activity. Okay? So that we, we have to do that. Now, secondly... This relationship needs to be marked by affection. Affection. It's something that very often doesn't get considered in intimate relationships, especially between men and men and women who are married, especially in families where there are kids. But affection means I like you. You are my best friend. You are a good friend. I can talk to you. You're an unconditional friend. You can know the most horrible thing about me, and you're still going to care. It's called unconditional friendship. Okay? That is vital to the point that when I'm doing counseling or therapy with a recovering person, and they come to me and say, wow, I met this person, and am I sexually attracted to him? I say, well you're probably not going to have a future in that relationship because if the primary grounding in an intimate relationship is sexual attraction, it will blow up on your, in your face. The primary grounding, in my opinion and my belief, to an enduring relationship is a bond of affection. It means I need to like you as a person. Now, my own personal recovery, I had some very trying times right after I got sober. Because out of five women that I dated, three of them attempted suicide. Now, that's a little bit higher than the odds. And I had to stop and think, maybe there's something just a tad wrong with my selection criteria. So I went into therapy, and my therapist gave me a direction. He says, well, when you go to a party or you meet somebody, you go to a party... You know, there are certain women there that just stand out. You're drawn to like a magnet. I said, yeah, I know. And he says, don't talk to them. <laughs> I says, you're nuts. He says, now you look around and you'll see a quieter person who you will decide is boring. Nice but boring. Go and force yourself to talk with them and ask them out. And expect nothing other than to talk with them for six to ten dates. I said, this man's crazy. What am I going out for if I can't get my mind blown with an intense sexual relationship? What good is that? How can I ever fall in love and have a happy relationship? Okay? But now this process of basing a relationship on affection and genuine liking of the person rather than on sexual magnetism is vital to intimacy. If the sexuality is more important than the bond of affection, your relationship is condemned to be extremely painful for you because sexuality doesn't last. Familiarity sexually takes away infatuation, and the normal cycles of a sexual relationship have peaks and valleys, ups and downs. It's good and it's not so good. It's super and it's kind of crummy sometimes. 
okay? And unless you have that bond of affection to supersede that, it isn't going to work. So there's got to be affection. Secondly, there's got to be love. Love, interesting word. You know, what does it mean? It means I care about you for who you are, and it is, my, it is in my best interest for you to act in your best interest. Even if your best interest means you don't fulfill my narcissistic, pathological fantasy of who I want to be. It means that if you need something for you, even if that's going to hurt me a little bit and hurt my ego a little bit, hey, maybe I'm going to have to go with it. Maybe there is a thing called deferred gratification. And maybe for the well-being of this relationship, I'm going to have to stick with you during periods of time where you're not feeding my ego, during periods of time where you're not getting down and worshiping me. Okay? And maybe I'm going to have to recognize that you've got a right to your own life, that you've got a right, even though we're closely and intimately involved, to live according to your standards and your values, and that I can still love you and be involved with you, even if your values don't totally correspond with mine. That's okay, because you see, I like you, you're my best friend, and I love you and I care about you, and I want you to do well in life. Regardless of what happens to me, I want you to do well. And then the third is a depth of knowledge. It's important. I've got to know you. I've got to know what makes you tick. I've got to know your values. I've got to know who you are. A depth of knowledge, which again requires time and dialogue, and talking, and communicating. And finally, there must be an intermixing or an interweaving of interests. I know so many people who come together to have sex, and they, don't, they un can't understand why their relationship isn't growing and prospering. He works in one job, she works in another job. They have no professional interests in common. When they come together, they engage in superficial social activities. They recreate together. They provide companionship to each other, and then they go back into their own separate world. There's no shared values. There's no shared responsibility. There is no mutual task that we are working at together to which I am vital and you are vital. There's you and there's me, and there's not much to us. The good relationship is three components, you and me and us. And the us is not an artificial, simple, contrived, recreational period where you spend together. The us has to be vital and meaningful, and we have to be doing something together that is sincerely, honestly, and in an in-depth way important to both of us. And it's got to be shared, meaning I am interdependent upon you to do this. I can't do it by myself without you. You have a vital role in that. Therefore, you can let me down, and I can let you down. And we're going to struggle not to do that together. We're going to struggle not to let each other down. But on the other hand, if we do, we know that we're going to forgive each other for it. We know that there's going to be some security here. Okay? So what are we really looking at with intimacy, the characteristics of intimacy? The first is a relationship to the inner character, essential nature, or genuine core of another human being. I'm not looking at what they look like, how they dress, the style of clothes they wear, what kind of car they have. I'm looking towards the person. Who are they? Can I be a friend to this person? Can I sincerely honor who they are as a person, and do I like it? Does being around them just kind of make me feel naturally good inside? My own personal belief is if you've got to work at a relationship, if your natural resting state in a relationship is one of discomfort that you believe you have to work at to make better, that relationship doesn't stand a chance. Because a good relationship is one where that bond of affection and that core level of knowledge about each other makes it enjoyable to be together. And I don't mean intense pleasure. I mean it's comfortable. It's nice. It's okay. We live easily together. We work easily together. We share easily together. And there may be moments of struggle and times of problems, but basically overriding this is this sense of, of hey, it's neat. It's nice. It's comfortable. There's a very close mental, physical, and social association with another person. We spend time together. We intermix and interweave our lives. We become thoroughly and closely interconnected or interrelated. 
Okay? We let ourselves become interconnected and interrelated. We actually develop an identity of an us or a we, if you're talking about a family unit. There's a we here. And we demonstrate a depth of detailed knowledge, understanding, and information about each other. I know about you. You know about me. It's amazing how many addicted, recovering addicted people and other people can't even figure out what to buy their spouse or the kids for Christmas because they don't know them well enough to know what they like because the addiction, addictive self-centeredness is so strong they can't take the time to find it out. There's a long personal association in near contact with another person, and the key word here is long. Truly intimate relationships do not come and go quickly. Intimacy takes time. It takes life experience. It takes people building history together, whether it's in a sexual relationship or a friendship relationship or a family relationship. I don't believe you can be truly intimate with somebody unless you've developed a history with them unless you have shared time and space together for a significant period of time. And one of the most rewarding aspects of intimacy is that shared history, that shared experience that builds and grows and gets richer and richer as time goes on. Okay? There must be a warm personal attitude developing through this long and close association. Okay? Warm personal affection it must be marked by friendliness, unreserved communication, mutual appreciation, and shared interest. Okay, so what do I have to do? I've got to be close to you. I have to feel friendliness towards you, not antagonism or animosity. I have to have unreserved communication. I can say what's on my mind. I can talk with you openly and honestly about what's happening in my life and mutual appreciation, knowing you're a fine person. And I feel honored and privileged to be in the company of a fine person and mutually shared interest. We have things we do together, participate in together, build together, and we are moving into the future doing something that both of us are essential components of. There must be an easy and unreserved personal expression of feelings and thoughts. got to be able to tell you what I feel, good or bad, and what I think, good or bad. And there must be an exclusive, limited, private, or special access to another person. Now, this is a thing we're losing touch with in the age of free sex and open relationships and all. I thought it was really interesting that the authors of Open Marriage got divorced. I really thought that was interesting. Uh, now, there, you know, if people are going to be truly intimate, there's got to be something special that goes on between people. There's got to be something unique onto us that is our hallmark of being together. There has to be something that we share together that is not public property. There must be something special and unique about that. And we have to work at creating that specialness and uniqueness, and we've got to know that that's something I'm not going to give away to just anybody, that I'm not going to defile in public. It's something that is special and unique onto us that I don't give away to just anybody. And it's not possible to be intimate with hundreds of people. It's not possible. You can get close to people. You can't be truly intimate. My belief is at any given time in your life, if you have a truly intimate relationship with three to five people, you're doing about three to five times better than most human beings because you simply do not have the time, the energy to, get, to work at intimacy with that many people. So the intimacy is a pyramid, and at the top is room primarily for one primary relationship and then a bunch of secondary intimate relationships. You know, being a single person, it's real interesting when I try to befriend someone who's married with kids. You know what I very rapidly find? They don't have time for me. Except for the ones who have pathological relationships. They have plenty of time for me. The ones who have healthy relationships, they're with their primary core family group. And they're investing time and energy in building that history together, and they relegate friends to just that, friends. And, you know, the healthiest people I know don't try to be intimate with everybody. They don't even pretend to be. They've got their life filled with people they value, they appreciate, and they're happy with that. Okay? The relationship finally must be a relationship of love and warmth and ardent liking and deep friendship and mutual cherishing, the taking care of one another. Now, if you've got these things going, you are intimate. Now, 
How do you like that, you addictive prone folks? <laughs> Is it possible to do all of that? Oh, by the way, do you know where this definition of intimacy came from? This is not my original work. I went to the Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, you know, the gigantic 400-page tome, and I copied it out of there nearly word for word. But this is a common sense of what intimacy is. But is it realistic? Is it practical? Is it possible? Not in an ideal form, it's not. But if you look at the core, core elements of this, namely a relationship that's marked by affection, I'm not saying intense love or infatuation, but I like you. I love you, meaning I put your best interest first. I want you to grow and prosper in your life. I have a depth of knowledge about you. I don't know everything about you, but I know you're good enough to know I like you, I care about you, I can trust you, I can basically predict what you're going to do, and I know you're not going to hurt me deliberately or intentionally. And I am interwoven with you in some real-life goals and objectives that we are working on together. Those four basic cores are not only realistic, they're essential if you're going to develop any stand, any segment of mental health in your recovery at all. To not have that makes you crazy, and you've got to turn to addictive behaviors to deal with the craziness because you don't have a place to go where you feel safe, which is the primary criteria of an intimate relationship. I can go home, not to a house, not to an apartment, but home. I can be with someone where I feel safe. And that's very realistic. But remember, these particular values here can be distorted through an addiction-prone personality and turned into a striving for perfection that diminishes and makes intimacy impossible. And this is what we have to look at. Intimacy is not hard, a struggle, a thing I've got to work at. If that's your attitude, go into therapy. But you have to be real careful because many therapists will tell you that that's what relationships are about. True intimacy is a comfortable living together with somebody who you respect, like, and share common interests with. It's a comfort. It's not a job. It's a pleasure. It's not painful. It doesn't have to hurt. It doesn't take a lot of energy. In the past several years, um, I've gotten involved with a lady who, believe it or not, I've never been infatuated with. God forbid. I've never obsessively thought about her at all in my entire life. I mean, I don't suddenly, when I'm doing something else, be overtaken with extremely passionate, intensive thoughts about her. Okay? I don't have to work at the relationship. We have our rough times. We've got to talk and be together and so on. But overwhelmingly, I feel guilty about the little bit of energy I put into the relationship. And she tends to feel the same way because we happen to like each other the way we are. We happen not to be engaged in the pathological desire to change each other. And just my own personal experience, if this is intimacy, and I, again, I don't consider myself an expert at this, and it's quite a new experience for me in my own growth and development and recovery, but if this is intimacy, it's kind of nice. Because it doesn't backlash on me, and it doesn't periodically hurt, and it doesn't periodically blow up, and as a result, it drives me crazy. Because this isn't what life's all about in my addiction-centered brain. See? And that's the struggle, I think, that an addict has in building an intimate relationship. And the struggle is not the struggle. And working with a therapist, the therapist says, you may be sober, but golly, you're a struggle addict. You've got to have your daily fix of struggle or you're not happy. And this is, I think, vital. Now, what are some of the obstacles? To intimacy, to recovery, and in addiction. What are some of them? Um, just very quickly, the first of them is the disease itself. And I'm just going to take about three or four minutes to talk about this. Our problem in this field is we say alcoholism and chemical dependency is a disease, but we don't really believe it. In terms of dealing with our recovering patients, we expect them to respond to marital counseling or relationship counseling in the same way as a normal person from day one of sobriety. We expect them to have time, energy to put into relationship building when they are two months or three months away from near death from a chronic disease episode. Addicts are sick people. Alcoholics are sick people. Chemical dependent people are sick people. 
Their brain is damaged from the toxic effects of the drugs that they have used, and there's good evidence that we've inherited some pretty abnormal neuropsychology. We've inherited some pretty bad abnormalities, and it takes time and energy to learn about these things, to learn how to manage them, and to overcome the psychological and social problems that our disease has inflicted upon us. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say this, intimacy and recovery is not your primary concern for the first one to two years of the patient's recovery. And to place upon the perfection-seeking, recovering alcoholic who's motivated by guilt and the feeling of being defective to become super perfect in their relationship will only do one thing. It'll cause them to get drunk. Because they need time and they need energy to do the most important thing in that first year that they need to do. Learn how to stay sober one day at a time and overcome their tendency not only towards addictive chemicals, except for caffeine or nicotine, right? Those don't count. Um, and uh, overcome their tendency towards addictive behaviors. Overcome that tendency towards addictive behavior, to stop being compulsive or type A. You want a frightening experience? There's a new book on treating type A behavior. Read it. It's scary. Scary. As, but they need to invest in their addiction. So what, what is the, what's the first step to intimacy and recovery for the family? You have to get a mutual coexistence pact. You have to bring the family together and say, this person is sick. They've got an addictive disease. You are sick. You've got a codependent disease or a co-addictive disease, and both of you need treatment and you need time to heal away from each other. Because right now, like it or not, your relationship is based upon addictive-centered values, addictive-centered behaviors, addictive-centered attitudes. And if you try to fix your relationship right now, you know what's going to happen? Short-term pain, long-term long pain, short-term gain, long-term pain, predictable outcomes that you feel compelled to get into even though you know they're going to hurt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're reinforcing the pathology. Mutual coexistence. What's the first step? There's a family, have a family meeting once a week where people talk. Make sure the recovery program includes one evening a week or one afternoon a week of family activities where the family has fun together. Get a commitment, at least for a time period, that the relationship's not in jeopardy, that people will tough it out for six months or a year or whatever while they work on it, and do everything you can to get those people into a recovery program. When do people really face the issue of dealing with recovery of relationship issues? This is a middle recovery task, which generally the, the recovering person gets into in the second and third years of abstinence. The second and third years. And then, unfortunately, they often go to therapists that feed the addiction-centered notion of relationship. They often do. It's interesting. Uh, when I meet family therapists, I ask how many of them are married, how many of them are divorced, and I ask them to describe their current relationship. And it's incredible how many of them don't have high-quality relationships. It's amazing how that happens. One of the reasons I don't do a lot of family therapy. I just do, mostly what I do is set up these mutual coexistence packs. And what I generally find is as the person recovers, the relationship gets better. Unless the person has some really bad pre-existing, pre-addiction intimacy and relationship issues. So what's my message to you? Well, alcoholics are sick, number one. Don't expect they're going to get their intimate relationship straight right from, right from the start. You've got to protect that relationship because there is something there. Any couple that can survive the ravages of addiction love each other. Now, they may not know that. They may not know how to express it, but they do. And we've got a right and an we've got an obligation, I believe, professionally, not to see people kiss goodbye relationships where they have 8, 10, 12, 15 years of history together. Because the pain of addiction can become the foundation of one of the most deeply spiritual and transcending relationships that a couple can ever experience. You know, it's interesting when you talk to war veterans, the group of people who go through near-death experiences are bound together in a special way for the rest of their life, and maybe for all eternity. And what about the people, the couples, the families that have weathered recovery, that have weathered the addictive crises, that have recovered together, they have something that is impossible to replicate.
And it, at times it may seem like it's impossible for these two crazy people to ever get a high-quality relationship, but it isn't. And that's one of the miracles in my mind of recovery, that people who have so nearly been destroyed by this disease, through recovery programs, through treatment, through AA Al-Anon, can come together again and learn how to be intimate, learn how to like each other, learn how to care for each other before I care about myself, learn how to responsibly share, and learn how to responsibly commit. And so if I wish you anything today, my wish to you is that at some point in your life, you're able to experience an addictive free relationship, which is marked by pain-free pleasure and just a deep-rooted sense of feeling good about your, about your significant relationship. You can't even say husband and wife these days. Isn't that tragic? About your husband, wife, or primary relationship, whatever that is. So that you can feel good about your children, so you can feel good about your family, and so that you can feel good about the people in your life. But the other wish I have for you is that you develop the wisdom to recognize you can't be intimate with everybody and that you focus your energy and you focus your time on people who really fit who you are and people who are really capable of caring about you. Because I think if that happens, you can start leaving behind a whole lot of the hectic pain-pleasure dynamics of an addictive lifestyle. And I wish that to each and every one of you. Thank you very much.